we all talk about how when we're going to go home, how proud we're going to be to be combat vets. I mean, how many people can say they're, they're combat veterans? You know, 19 years old, I fought in a war. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Nothing can beat that. That's the coolest thing in the world, you know. It'll be fun to look back on. Just waiting to get to that point where I can look back on it. Oh, <laughs> uh, here it is. Oh. Uh. Uh, 2003, uh, they got us out here in Baghdad, life is hard, got us pulling fucking two hours of guard, then they ump it up to eight between twelve, I don't give a fuck, I think I'm stuck in hell, uh, I'd rather be there instead of jail, putting Baghdad on the map, what? send me my mail, It's not a moment of the day that go by that not a thought about Baghdad never crosses my mind. It made me who I am today. Go into a country where you don't know nothing. Knowing it's going down, knowing you're hearing the bombs and the gunshots. It's real now. Like you've been trained for it, they done told you about it. Now you are here. Drum it, calm down. It's a wedding day. They always shoot up in the air Wednesday. Yeah, nothing though, man. I'm already ready. That's the worst shit you can go through at the age that we was going through it. They're trying to hit the compound. Someone smoking a cigarette in the shitters? <laughs> oh, what are you gonna do when you get out of the army? Be a fucking rock star. Sometimes I remember, oh yeah, that's right, I went to Iraq. Now that I have a kid, sometimes I find myself thinking, is he gonna end up going to some war that ends up not doing any good for the world and receive a bunch of shitty care <laughs> afterwards? I think we were in Baghdad for a few days and then we were in a firefight outside the Abu Hanifa Mosque. And it was just totally bizarre, just you know, fucking gunfire everywhere, it's a couple of RPGs. And I was just thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> and that question never went away. I don't know how to explain the war to myself and have yet to have any clear thought of like, yes, we actually made a difference there because we didn't at all. There was no difference fucking made. Uh, maybe for the worse. The area I come from is uh, very small. Not a lot of opportunities for people fresh out of high school. So it's either community college or go do something, travel the world, get paid for it, experience places like this. I had swore I'd never join the Army. I watched my brother come home all rigid when I was like 12, and I was like, no way. And then he called me and he said, you watching this shit? And I said, what? He goes, turn on the television. And about 30 seconds after I turned on the television, the second plane hit. When that happened, one, I was mad, you know, it was just my fucking backyard. Um, but I immediately thought, you know, this is what I need to do. I need, I need to, to, to defend my, I just felt it. I just had to do it. I had to go join my brother. I had to be by his side. There was no way I was going to let my brother go into a war and me not be there. We'll keep one saw back here. Just know where your people are. And we got the rear. So you need to start holding that like fucking meeting. That deployment was funny because there was no clear cut mission. The whole time you're wondering, like, what are we really doing? Are we really in combat? Are we not in combat? Who's actually the enemy? Now you're in Baghdad. Now you're in the heart of Adamia. Now you're. Now what? going through my mind was it was dark out and I couldn't see my fingers basically I was hoping I still had my fingers I couldn't tell where I was shot I just knew my arm was numb and I found out I had my fingers and I could move them the doc came by and he was patching me up and we just had a, a shallow conversation about uh, you know oh wow man you got shot and I was like yeah and I think I was only 19 at that point and to be shot in the first two weeks of a 16 month deployment <laughs> was was setting the tone to say the least IEDs are the scariest. Gunfire and crap like that, that shit don't bother me, you know, it's whatever. But IEDs, they had that shit in garbage, man, and it could be anywhere. 
and you riding through the hood and you see a milk jug on the side of the road, but the, the milk jug look kind of cut or a trash bag. The trash bag look kind of ripped up. That's the shit that they will put the fucking bombs in. Back up! Clear the road! Possible ID! I don't see any wires, but it's on the surface. We found Coke cans with plastic explosives in them on the corner. And when you're walking around a neighborhood that's literally I mean, trash up and down the streets, it's, you can't really tell where they are. You see us when we're going around corners and there's a box on the side of the road. It's just you know, cringe and take the turn. Hopefully you don't hear a bang. I still cringe when I pass garbage. I still, I ask my wife, she goes nuts. I avoid garbage like the plague on the road. I will swerve my car to the other side. She's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? We're riding in the open tailgate of a truck and people are getting fucked up all the time and we'd still go out there with it. Part of our $87 billion budget <laughs> provided for us to have some secondary armor put on top of our thin-skinned Humvees. This armor was made in Iraq. It's high-quality metal, and it will probably slow down the shrapnel so that it stays in your body instead of going clean through. And that's about it. When we first got here, they were waving at us, uh, and next minute, as soon as we drive by, we'd get shot at. And or some days they'd look at us mean and you know give us gestures that they didn't want us there. And when I first got there, I noticed a lot of people doing this to me. Fuck you. Fuck you, American. They didn't say fuck you. They were just... And about four months into it, my interpreter looks at me and goes, Sergeant Beatty, have patience. Wait, what? Have patience. We hit houses with the wrong address. And then we'd have to apologize because we just kicked your door in or we just blew your door in or we just damaged your house at three o'clock in the morning. I still hear it in the psychological side of it. Now, I still carry. Hey. Hey. Yeah, you see that in the camera. I'm a journalist, you do that. Quiet. You're mistaken, this. Be quiet. Be quiet. I still think about that guy. I still remember punching him in the face. When he was going for this, when I punched him in his fucking face. Oh, yeah? Yeah, there's his glasses right there. If you look and you put yourself in their place, how would you feel if you had someone kicking in your door and you as the man want to protect your family and me coming through the door with bad intentions? Because the intel that I received told me you're a bad guy. Just shut your mouth when you arrive. Just shut your mouth. Hey, hey. Your mouth shut up. Yeah, I know that. Shut up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm always going to carry that. And uh, I'm still working on that. Pick him up. He goes outside the wall. Just that. Shut him up. Yeah. He's protecting his house. He gets punched in the face, put on his damn back, ends up in Abu Ghraib, and he's never going to get that time back. So I think about that.
I don't feel like I'm defending my country anymore, and that kind of sucks. And that's that's the whole purpose when you're a kid to join the army. A lot of people lot. feel it's like you know, defend your country, but we're not defending our country anymore. I know uh, we I haven't defended our country in a while, but I didn't agree with the Iraq War when I went in. I, I was I went in for Afghanistan. I joined to go fight in the mountains. I wanted to fight fucking. I, I wanted to fight the Taliban. Um, you know, unfortunately, once you join, you have no politics, your property, you know, you go where they send you. When I was 20, I thought we were invincible. We were kids. We were just invincible. We're going to go here, we're going to do this, and we're going to get out. And I tell people to this day, the day that I grew up was November the 1st, 2003. That was the day I grew up. I think that's the day we all grew up. And you say that day, and it just... We just got the call over the radio and that one of our Humvees was engaged with some kind of RPG or IED. Nobody knew what it was at first. It just hit, and it hit hard. Our Humvee was limping back to the, to the compound, and we were getting status reports just constantly. And then we all just kind of went on with what we had to do that night. And then we got up the next day, and they told us we had a nine o'clock formation. Nobody told us as to why. And I lined up the whole battery. And the BC came out, and he was, he was already crying. He was really shook up, and we knew something was bad. And he told us that during the night that Lieutenant Colgan had died. And then he just, everybody's heads just went down. It was, you could hear the, the gasps and the, tears and a lot of people. I think most people really wanted to go out and just kill everybody after that. Uh, it was the first death we had suffered in the battalion and then we'd had people hurt, but no one had died yet. That's a really big thing to just grasp all of a sudden. It's one of the things you'll never forget. Several other people in our unit were killed. Lieutenant Saltz, PFC Moore, uh, Sergeant Major Cook was killed. Um, Sergeant McKeever. Rest in peace, boys. I don't like talking about that shit. That shit is so fucking depressing, man. You just have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. Man. So what does it do to a generation of young people during these deployments? They become old. They are old young men. Yeah, I mean, I feel more grown up. I mean, I've changed a lot in the last, you know, year. You know, for people back in the States, it was just a year. You know, nothing really changed. They just got a year older. You know, for me, it was like, you know, a lifetime, you know. I feel I've grown up. 20, 30 years out here. And every day it was, well, I guess I'm just doing what I'm doing today so that I can get to tomorrow, so that we can get to our 365 days and leave. And then that changed. Then we stayed out there for a few more months. I think it was like 419 days that we were there. Maybe George Bush should fund my fucking guitar business. He owes me a beer, at least, at the minimum. The Iraqis are probably wondering how in the hell are they supposed to believe in a system that we forced fed them when our system doesn't even work. Going back to George Floyd. Two words, not okay. There's actually a picture of me in Time Magazine with my knee on a suspected terrorist chest. It wasn't on his carotid artery. It was across his chest. All these shootings, not okay. My mom doesn't like the army too much because I mean, took both her boys and we're over here, you know, she hates that, but she's very proud. 
and nothing beats it. It's the greatest feeling in the world. Jason's bike was always affectionately known as the asshole, because that was my brother. Pocket When shit gets dark, you know, and you're thinking about ending it or whatever, you call someone. Jason was that phone call for me, and I was always that phone call for Jason. So it was hard for me when he did do what he did. You know, the first few months, or and then he called. Why didn't he call me? And I don't have to answer.